Hi everyone and welcome to our next unit uh, in AP Psych. Today we are going to be starting our intelligence unit and actually the unit is called testing and individual differences but most of the unit focuses on um, intelligence testing and then how humans are different in intelligence testing and also some other tests. So we're going to start off by focusing on intelligence and the question is like what is intelligence? So there's a lot of controversy debate around what it means to be smart and what intelligence is and is it one thing or is it multiple things. But in general, the definition is the mental ability needed to adapt to, to shape your environment, to select your environment, to be able to solve problems, to reason, and to meet challenges and goals in your life. So how do we measure intelligence? We're going to start with kind of the history of measuring intelligence and then move to how it's measured today. And then we'll include some newer tests um, that aren't explicit IQ tests, but still are tests that are measuring your abilities to reason, problem solve, etc. Uh, but like I said, it's highly controversial. Uh, the idea is like, oh, is it one thing? Is it multiple things? A lot of psychologists or most psychologists now view intelligence as a normally distributed trait. That means that IQ falls on the bell curve and that we can measure IQ by giving you different um, types of performance tasks, both verbal and nonverbal, and we can then put your score in that um, normal distribution. So where did IQ testing come from? Or where, where did testing come from? Uh, Sir Francis Galton is the guy that we think of when we think about the foundings of testing your mental abilities, uh, and that now is called psychometrics. So the science of testing your mental abilities uh, was founded by Sir Francis Galton. And what he did is he had started studying family trees, and he found that success ran in these families. And so he jumped to the conclusion that that meant that success or that being successful meant that you were intelligent, and then intelligence was something that you got from your heredity, right? It's something that was passed down from generation to generation. And as part of this, uh, he decided that it was a good idea to start testing this intelligence, right? He wanted to figure out how he could give someone an IQ score, right? And so although there was no like idea yet about how you would do this, he thought that you could maybe test it through people's senses. So thinking about like being able to recognize high-pitched sounds or their vision or these kinds of things. And ultimately, like, that was not a good way to test intelligence. But just the idea that one could test your mental abilities is something that um, kind of started with Sir Francis Galton. And continuing with the family tree idea and the idea of genetics being what determines your um, intelligence, uh, Sir Francis Galton was kind of known for uh, the eugenics movement, which is the idea that he believed that if you could measure traits, uh, you could pick somebody who had the strongest traits, you know, the best traits, and that you could encourage them uh, to mate. And that way then, of course, then you would have like the best uh, possible, you know, evolutionary being moving forward. Okay, so the Stanford Binet test. So this is kind of the first uh, real intelligence test uh, that we think of that really worked to measure IQ and the way that they understood it uh, at the turn of the century. So basically France decided that um, all kids were gonna go to school, right? So not all kids always went to school. So all kids were gonna go to school. Okay, so now here's the problem. All these kids go to school, but they're not all at the same level. And how do we figure out which kids need extra help? So they asked Alfred Binet to develop a test for kids who were intellectually deficient in order to get them some extra help, okay? The idea of this was never to um, say that if they needed extra help, it was genetic in nature. Um, Binet put zero argument on how or why they became uh, in need of extra um, like help and assistance in certain areas, but just to identify them. And the way that he scored this was an idea of mental age. So really what he took is he said, okay, so if, you, um, if, if you're an average nine-year-old, then you should perform like other nine-year-olds. But if you're performing like a seven-year-old, then that would mean that you're below average. Or if you're performing like an 11-year-old would, but you're seven, then that would be above average. So he kind of compared your mental performance to that what was typical of the chronological age. Okay, so in 1916, uh, Stanford psychologist Lewis Terman took this test and brought it back to America and renamed it uh, Stanford Binet Test. 
and it is very similar to the original Binet test, but he made some additions on uh, the types of questioning and also the way it was scored. So they came up with the way to actually give you an IQ score with this Stanford Binet test. And the IQ score was measured by your mental age, that's MA, divided by your chronological age, CA, times 100. So if you had a mental age of 12 and a chronological age of 12, then that would be 1 times 100. Your IQ would be 100, right? So then, of course, if you had a lower, like a higher mental age, so a mental age of 14 or 15 and a chronological age of 12, then your IQ ends up being above 100 versus if you had a lower mental age, like 7 and your chronological age is 12, then you would have a lower than IQ. Uh, IQ lower than 100, right? Now, here's the problem with this, right? So uh, it doesn't work for adults because at some point, Ms. Schaefer keeps getting older and her IQ is not going to keep getting better. So when I was 18, maybe I was uh, mental age 18, chronological age 18, and then I got to be 30 and all of a sudden now my mental age is still 18 or 21 and my chronological age is 32 and I got less smart over time, right? So there's obviously a problem with this. Eventually, this test was also uh, used for arriving immigrants and World War I Army recruits. I'm going to give you a sample of this in class. So um, then we had to come up with an adult test, right, because that was for, for kids, for children. Uh, so they, the newest test and the one that we use most frequently today is called the Wechsler Adult Intelligence Scale. And it was created for adults, but then eventually he did create versions for children. And what's interesting about this is he now tested both verbal and nonverbal abilities, which was not tested before with the Stanford Binet. It has an overall score, so it's called a G, your general intelligence, and then you get a verbal score and a performance, which is your nonverbal score. And what's also important about this test is that he got rid of the um, original IQ way, right, mental divided by chronological times 100, and started to use a normal distribution. So the idea that he would figure out um, how everyone scored on an IQ test, um, and then he would develop someone's score based on the range they fell in, right? Standardization. And we'll talk a little bit more about this, but you know, we've also already discussed what the bell curve or what that normal distribution looks like and um, what it means for an IQ, standard deviation, et cetera. So here's just some sample items. You can stop and take a look at some of these. We're gonna do some in class. Okay, there are two other types of modern testing that I want you to know about, um, and I'm sure you're familiar with them because you've taken a bunch of them. So there's aptitude tests and achievement tests. Aptitude tests are meant to measure your future performance. So uh, a lot of you guys take aptitude tests to get into college, and it's meant to measure your future performance in college. Achievement tests are a test that you take that measure what you actually know currently, like your past learning. So the AP test that you're going to take uh, in May is an example of an achievement test. Final exams are achievement tests. Um, and both of these tests are used, of course, depending on what it is that you're measuring, and they're very uh, common today. So people differ in their IQ scores, right? So the question is, how do we explain this difference? Do we explain it by heredity, right, which is our nature argument? Or do we explain it by environment, which is our nurture argument? And of course, just like every other thing in psychology, there are numerous uh, pieces of evidence for each side of the argument and that ultimately it is not one or the other, but combinations of both. So let's talk about the heredity um, argument. So the idea is just what we talked about before with twins and um, identical twins versus paternal and adopted uh, siblings versus non-adopted siblings, and we measure them against each other. They find that identical twins are more similar than paternal twins in their IQ. So because identical twins are more similar, that must show that um, genetics matters because they have a closer genetic, but then the exact same environment, or not even closer, the exact same genetics, but then a... Um, you know, they have the same environment as a fraternal, like they're grown, they grow up together, right? So if you look over here on this test, identical twins reared together, right, have the highest similarity, while as fraternal twins reared together are significantly lower from this bar to this bar, right? So that shows that the environment would be the same, but it would be the genetics that would matter. Adopted children also have a more similar IQ to their biological parents as they age. So as they get older, um, they start to look more and more like their biological parents in their IQ abilities and scores. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, if you're thinking about like, well, where is genetics or where it, where is it? Is there like a gene for intelligence? They haven't found a particular gene uh, for intelligence. Uh, in fact, intelligence is thought of to be polygenetic. So it, it's made up of a compilations of different uh, parts of different genes that make then make up someone's entire um, intellectual ability. But like I said, it's not just all uh, heredity or genetics. 
there are plenty of arguments on the environmental side as well. So something for um, environment is that identical twins reared together show more similar scores than identical twins reared apart. So identical twins reared together, right? And identical twins reared apart, exact same genetics, but the environment is different. And so if there's more similarities between those reared together, it shows that there has to be some environmental influence. Another really um, uh, important thing to look at is the idea of if you uh, deprive a children a child of certain like intellectual stabilities or nutrition or um, love and caring versus if you give them an enrichment environment. And we show uh, research shows that kids who are in a deprived environment and then you bring them into an enriched environment, their IQ scores grow, right? An environment that has good nutrition and where they're given lots of intellectual stimulation uh, definitely makes a difference in terms of their overall IQ score. And then something else that we've realized is the Flynn effect. So they found that uh, IQ scores are rising with each generation. So what would have been a 125 uh, IQ score generations ago now is just a 100 IQ score. And so there's really no way to explain that without the idea of the environment taking an impact, right? So the, the technological changes that have been made or the amount of information available to us has increased our overall intelligence as a population because the idea that genetics would change that fast in terms of evolution just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. That's all for now, AP Psychos. And remember, psychology is flipping awesome.